Welcome back to the Confidence Formula. We are getting into week three, the pillars of defense. Uh, and I match this up exactly because I like threes and matching week three with the three pillars just made me happy. And the three pillars are containing every drive, contesting every shot, and then rebounding every miss. And as simple as that sounds, that's really, I've given a lot of thought to that. That's really the core of every defense. If you can do these three as an individual player, if you can do these three as a team, like you're going to be successful about 80% or more of the time. And uh, I owe credit to a mentor of mine named Ron Ecker that actually gave me this framework. And this is how he described it. He was a longtime NBA assistant coach and a longtime college coach. Uh, worked with some famous players back in the day. But um, really, after digging hard, trying to find other aspects that are really essential to defense, I wasn't able to find any more. So like, this is my most simple framework I can give you that you don't really have to get good at anything else if you can do these three things as a defensive player. And there's evolution and layers of this as you get into the complexity of five on five and team defense. But if you just have these in mind all the time, you're going to do pretty well as a defender. So let's get into them one at a time. First is containing every drive and ideally doing so without any help needed. And that's a, a big weakness that I see a lot of players, especially as you get into seventh, eighth grade and freshman year of high school. A lot of us have played mostly zone defense, maybe with our rec team or even our AAU team. And now our freshman high school coach is like, we are playing hard-nosed man-to-man defense and you're in for a rude awakening if you haven't had that approach or haven't had any framework of like how to work on defense outside of your coach drilling you with doing defensive slide drills, you know, when you're on the court in practice. Um, so three things we're going to work on around containing every drive. And the, the third one's actually two parts. We'll show you a, a video demo in a second, but I like to work first on like the strategy of defense is where do we want the ball to have to go? And another mentor of mine, Noah LaRoche, actually uh, gave me this idea you know, only a few years ago. Like I had not had a good like universal principle like I like to get for all things uh, related to defense. Like there's always the, the general consensus among coaches, which is kind of just handed down from coach to coach is force the ball to drive baseline. But what Ron Ecker got to, and I was working with him as my mentor, was you should drive toward where traffic is or toward the middle is where there's more likely to be traffic. But what uh, Noah LaRoche really helped me put another layer on that is just drive back toward the pass. If we think about what we're going to work on offense with you a lot is we want to drive away from the pass on offense because all the defense is coming from where the pass just was. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have thrown a pass. They would have tried to score. Defense forced the ball to pass, and therefore the defense is coming from the pass. And if we drive away from the pass on offense, we're likely to find better open space and more opportunities to score. So just flipping that on its head as a defender, I want to force the ball back toward the pass because I know there were just people in the way over there. If I force the ball to drive back into that crowd of people, they're going to have a much harder time scoring. And again, really makes me happy when I can find a universal principle that I can pass on to you and is again, like 80% correct. Like if you do this all the time, you're going to do really well on defense. The second part of that is our stick arm. If you watch a really good high level NBA defender, you're going to see them down low shoulders forward, arm out in a stick position, just annoying the ball all the time. But by using that stick arm as a measuring stick, we actually give ourselves a cushion of space and therefore time to react. So even if I'm playing the fastest athlete in the world, if I have a four foot arm length of space, he's not going to get past me with his first step. And this is where we get into the whole philosophy of containing versus trying to pick his pocket and steal it. In order to steal it, I really have to be collapsing that space. I got to be close to him enough to like reach across his body and deflect his ball and get a steal. And so if we let go of the need to steal, which is in my mind kind of a, uh, I don't know how the best to describe it, but it's a way of like 
showing off on defense, right? If I can pick your pocket, then I'm a good defender is kind of the, the approach or the perspective that's common out there in basketball culture. But if you contain your guy and he never gets past you, you're not going to make any highlight reels. You might not even have any steals for the game, but he's never going to score or he's hardly ever going to score as we get into our other pieces. And therefore you're a lot more effective defender. You just don't have any highlight reel steals to go uh, make you feel good about yourself. So the stick arm is my way of making sure you always have a cushion of space. You're always in front of the ball. He's never getting past you. And whenever you choose to take a shot, you're there in front of him, able to contest, which is our next piece. And then where the uh, where the traction actually happens is footwork, like a lot of things we're going to do. The L step and the X step. And that was, again, um, kind of my own simplification of footwork. I watch a lot of coaches work with players like you on sliding their feet. And like slide your feet, slide your feet, slide your feet. It's like the panacea of coaching defense is like that's the only thing to do. If you get good at that, then you're going to be a wonderful defender. But I always look at the ball handler is running and you are sliding. You're going to lose the race half the time because they're running and you're sliding. And so we need to work on the transition. So, you know, sliding up and down the court at the same speed in a single direction for 20 to 30 strides in some cases, if you're going full court, is really useless. Like in my experience, you're rarely going to go more than two steps in the same direction or at the same speed without changing something like ball handler is not going to continue forever in one line. They're going to change speed or change direction or both. And therefore what we need to get good at as defenders in order to contain the ball is getting good at transitioning between running and sliding between running forward to sliding sideways and from sliding sideways to running the same direction or sliding one direction to running the other direction and vice versa, running one direction to then open up and slide the second direction. If we just get good at those two transitions and how they interact with each other, again, 80% of our defensive need is going to be covered. We're going to be able to, purely with footwork and strategy and stick arm of cushion of space, we're going to be able to stay in front of the ball with most ball handlers we're ever going to run up against. So let's see what this looks like on video. We're going to see the uh, the stick arm position. We'll see a little bit of slow-mo first. So stick arm is just my measuring stick. And then you can see our, um, our positioning here. So I'm setting this situation up like my passer point guard on offense was here. So the pass came from this direction, which I'm the defender in this case. This is from my right because I'm facing the camera. And therefore, I am setting up my feet and my positioning strategically so that it's a one-way street for him to drive to my right back toward the pass, what we talked about. And then the, the L step is what we're executing here. I went from running forward toward him to sliding sideways. We're going to see that again. A little bit of slow-mo. Stick arm into slide to my right. So the literal L step is running forward onto my left foot and then sliding onto my right foot, making that transition happen. And even though we're going slow, this can take some time to just get comfortable with that because most people have never thought about their feet as much as I've thought about your feet and how to make that work efficiently. But if you get this, you're going to be in good shape. Again, 80% of the time, they're not going to be able to stop you. So the L step is simply running forward to sliding sideways. Then the X step is when this ball handler takes off at a faster speed. I can't keep up sliding because he's running. I need to turn and run. So the X step is simply crossing over my feet into a run by turning my hips and my shoulders and able to stay in front of the ball. Now you'll hear coaches say, never cross your feet on defense. They're talking about while sliding, keeping your toes toward the ball, you don't want to cross your feet because you'll trip. And what we're working on is intentionally crossing over our feet into a running stride. So our our toes and our nose, how I like to say it, toes and nose are pointed the same direction, running parallel with the ball instead of facing the ball. And that makes really the biggest difference in the world. We'll talk about measuring stick on our court. You know, the number of tiles you can move with a sliding step is about two or three. A running stride is roughly double that. Like you can go five or six tiles with a single stride and therefore you can double the distance, essentially double the speed you're moving and have a lot better time staying in front of the ball. 
So let's talk about contesting next. Contesting every shot is the ideal goal. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is contesting the line of sight. Contesting the shooter's vision is far easier and far more effective than always trying to contest the ball and try to block the shot. Like you can put yourself in a lot of dangerous positions, a lot of risky positions by always trying to block a shot. You're going to be more likely to foul. You're going to be more likely to fly by the shooter and be out of position or just be in the air when they actually attack if they give you a really good shot fake. And so I call it the laser versus the rainbow. Between the shooter's eyes and the rim is a straight line that you can always reach. No matter how tall they are, even if I'm seven foot five Wimbayama guy, you can jump and reach seven foot five with your hand there and you're going to have your hand between his eyes and the rim and he's going to miss more shots with just that happening compared to the rainbow of a shot reaches about 14 or 15 feet most of the time you know four or five feet above the rim in order to drop on the basket so like reaching that rainbow height to try to contest the ball is a lot more difficult and actually not as effective as just contesting the shooter's line of vision or line of sight uh luke cornett has kind of uh, made this approach uh, more popularized recently. He's very tall, very slow white guy on the Celtics, and he stands in the paint but jumps in in time with the shooter. Even if the shooter's at the three point line and he's in the charge circle, you know, twenty feet away, he's going to jump in time with their shot and have his hands again in their line of sight and actually have a measurable impact. And if you're the on ball defender instead of that. Luke Cornett rim defender, you're going to have even a bigger effect. Like it, I call it within six feet of the shooter. If you're going up the same time as they are, they can't tell depth perception wise that you're not actually trying to go block them. They see you go up at the same time they're going up and you're in their way in their line of sight as they shoot. What we see is that shooting percentage drops by half. We're going to talk about this later on into week 9, 10, 11 about uh, all the different pieces of basketball math, I call it, how to calculate that field goal percentage, both as an offensive player and as a defender. How can you make an impact on that? And roughly what we see across all levels is we have pretty equal level up of ability on offense and ability on defense, whether it's high school or college or NBA, like defenders get better as offensive players get better. And it's roughly 50% drop. If you're uncontested in the NBA, you're likely making 70%, even at three point range, you're going to make 70 out of every hundred shots. But if you're contested, it drops to 35 or 40, which is where most players average in the NBA, because Again, there's good defenders. Most of those are contested shots. And so simply putting your hand in the shooter's eyes, line of sight, every time they take a shot can dramatically drop how effective their field goal percentage is and therefore create more misses. And it also, by focusing on timing rather than proximity, right? Rather than trying to get really close to block the ball, we're focused on timing with the jump of the shooter, no matter how far away we still are, we defeat their ability to shot fake us, right? Where if we were trying to go block them and they shot fake us, like we're falling onto them, fouling them or flying by and out of position. With this approach, we're going up and back down in time with them. And likely we didn't try to get really close to them. So we still have our stick arm distance of space as a cushion. And now after their shot fake, they try to drive suddenly, we're still there. We didn't lose our advantage. We didn't lose our position. We were able to maintain the space. And now we're still there to annoy them, contain them, make them try again and shoot over us where they thought they were going to try to fake us out with a shot fake and get us out of position. Um, this is really, you know, back to the core of being a disciplined defender, just like we don't care about stealing the ball if we can contain it. We don't care about blocking the shot if we can contest it. And changing your mindset about that is one of the pieces I hope to convince you of and make you a more effective player. Maybe not as many highlight reels, but you're going to be a lockdown defender and it'll show up in a lot of other ways as you get good at that. Let's see an example of what contesting looks like. You're going to see me jump right at the edge of the paint 
timing it with the shot, going as high up and as straight as possible just to reach the line of sight of our shooter. And I'm starting excessively far back so that it's obvious. It's the same way we'll approach it with you on the court. We're going to start you in the charge circle so that it's more obvious. You don't have a chance to block the shot because you're too far away, but you can still time it. And here I'm just demonstrating that line of sight idea. Like my hand can reach his vision very easily, even without jumping, if I can get into that six foot bubble as an on ball defender. And then just applying this with our stick arm, if I force a drive whenever he picks it up to shoot it, assuming I've done my first job of containment, whenever he goes up to shoot, I'm there waiting for him and I'm going to contest and then bump. And chase is what we call our rebounding part, which is what we're going to talk about next. Rebound every miss. So another framework I like to use is uh, the idea of playing to win versus playing not to lose. I think of boxing out as much of a cliche as that is. It's very, uh, very overstated and undertaught, in my opinion. But everybody's trying to hold back the other guy from getting the ball in boxing out. And I consider that like playing not to lose. Like I'm playing so that he doesn't get the ball. But by doing so, I myself never get the ball. And so I like to take a more offensive approach. Even as a defensive rebounder, I'm going to take the aggressive approach of going after the ball. And so kind of the sped up version we talk about. Instead of boxing out, we call it bump and chase. So we're not just holding the other guy back so he never gets it. And we hope maybe somebody on our team will get it, which sometimes it doesn't happen because we're all holding somebody back and the ball drops and then, you know, somebody ends up with it kind of unintentionally. So bump and chase is just a way of connecting our other two pieces. So using our stick arm as our contest arm and then also as our bump arm, which you'll see on video again in a second. We're going to try to just check that offensive player or whoever our opponent is, could be offense or defense, depending on the situation. We're going to bump our opponent in the chest with a forearm before we go chase the ball. That frees up our hands very quickly, gets us moving faster, really gives us a chance to go get the ball. And I always like uh, play on words, so I've underlined this because... This is the bottom line. Go get the ball. We don't care about holding back the other guy. We care about really putting ourselves in a position like a head start of a race. We're going to get the ball more often if we just bump the guy and put our body between him and where we think the ball is going, which is another big part we're going to work out on as part of rebounding is anticipation, which I think is a skill in itself. If you listen to like recordings of Dennis Rodman, one of the most famous rebounders of all time, he would stand in warm-up lines and watch how his teammates overspin or uh, top spin or backspin, how many rotations the ball had before it hit the rim. And like he was really laser focused on observing and anticipating how the ball was going to bounce off the rim based on how it was shot. And I think that's where you can actually get the most leverage. Whether you're the shortest guy on the floor or the slowest guy on the floor, if you know where the ball's going better than anybody else and you simply bump the other guy to stop his momentum and give yourself the position of a head start, then you're going to go get the ball a lot more. And that's what we're after. We don't care about what it looks like. We don't care about whether you did actually get your hips and butt into the other player to stop their momentum as a box out would be required of most coaches. We just want you to make contact and go get the ball first. And if you get the ball, then you did the job. And sometimes you don't actually have to bump anybody. You're already in a good head start position. You can run and get the ball first. And that's the end goal that we're after. Boxing out is kind of misdirected in some ways. Like you're always trying to stop the other guy and you could have just got the ball the whole point is to get the ball more often. And so that's what we're going to try and get better at. So let's see an uh, example of this on video. Really just connecting the pieces. Eventually, we're going to do what I call the trifecta, which is my favorite part of putting all three of these together. Our three pillars trifecta. So here's an example of our stick arm, contest arm, and bump arm all being the same side of our body. And if you notice, 
Which side that is, is what we'd call our outside. So away from the middle of the court, away from the basket, is the hand we're going to contest and bump with so that we're turning toward the middle. The ball's going to land on the basket. It's going to bounce around the basket most of the time. Enders to our right, we're contesting right arm, bumping right arm, and opening in front of him to the outside so that we see the middle first and we have a chance to go attack. And then the trifecta that I said I really like is what we're going to get to is playing one-on-one -on -one with this and only give you a point on defense if you contain the ball so he doesn't get to the paint or at least to a deep paint layup. You can test whatever shot he does take and then you bump him and end up with the rebound. If you execute all three of those, you have completed one trifecta. And our goal is to get three of those in uh, one game of one-on-one -on -one in order to be the winner of that round. And really uh, takes a lot of discipline, takes some practice. You'll get like one out of three and then two out of three and sometimes zero out of three. And then once in a while, it'll start to click and you'll get all three done. And if you take that and nothing else from this whole course, you're going to be a lot better defender by executing the three pillars of defense and being able to do the trifecta every time you're guarding the ball. So quick summary, no steal necessary. We want to contain the ball. We don't need to get a highlight reel by getting a steal. And we're going to use our stick arm and our strategic position to force the ball back toward the pass and our L step and our X step footwork to get really good at containing the ball. Second, we're going to contest their line of sight. We don't care about blocking the shot. If we can contest it and make them miss twice as many shots as they normally would, we're going to be in good shape. Assuming we've done both of those, they're going to miss a lot of shots in the game. So we need to go get the ball, bump and chase them by having a good position and treating it like the head start of a track race. We're going to go after the ball first and end up getting the ball in our hands a lot more often, which is going to lead to a lot more fun, fast paced offense opportunities after playing good defense. That's it for week three. I'll see you on the court soon.